It's my great pleasure to welcome to Montgomery Dr. Richard Powell, who is the John Spencer Bassett Professor of Art and Art History at Duke University. He has been a professor at Duke since 1989, which is a year after he received his PhD in art history at Yale University, uh, previously studying at Morehouse College and Howard University. Um, at Yale, he teaches courses in American art, arts of the African diaspora, and contemporary visual studies. He is recognized for his publications that include The Homecoming, Homecoming the Art and the Life of William H. Johnson, Black Art, Cultural History, and, a cutting, and Cutting a Figure, Fashioning Black Portraiture. In 2019, Professor Powell served as the Edmund J. Safra Visiting Professor at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and he is currently preparing an update and a revision of his book published in 1987 titled Black Art, A Cultural History. Please welcome, join me in welcoming to Montgomery Professor Richard Powell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts and the organizers of bearing witness uh, for inviting me to be a part of what's been a, an incredible and very uh, enlightening uh, set of days, um, thinking about, looking at, contemplating uh, art of Alabama. When I was invited uh, by Margaret Lynn to uh, speak to you today, um, I was asked to talk about um, Alabama's self-taught artists, and I will do that. Uh, but I realized as I was preparing uh, my comments for today that I wanted to do that uh, in a particular way. I wanted to uh, provide you with uh, a broad overview of, of this category of art, but I also wanted to ask you to think about this body of work in a slightly different way than we are accustomed to thinking about and contemplating that kind of art. I, one of the things that, that, that I kept on coming back to was the idea of art not just uh, being a personal expression, but art um, having an agenda, art having a purpose, art having this charge to to do work, and that work often has to do with society and the needs of society for a voice or, or an eye, if you will, to ask the public to reimagine itself. And as you see from the title of my presentation today, the subtitle are Plaints and Acclamations. And as I was thinking about so much of the work that we'll be seeing in a few minutes, I was um, not just seeing but hearing from these artists, um, these, um, these voices of, of remonstration, of remembrance, of memory, and also voices of, um, for lack of a better word, you know, celebration. And all of that, I found, was framed within that trite word love. And I thought for a moment, well, maybe I shouldn't talk about love. <laughs> maybe I should, I should just kind of let the art kind of do itself. But I'll never forget when I was doing a project um, some years ago, and I uh, contacted a very famous uh, New York photographer 
and um, asked him about his work, he said, oh, I never speak for my work. I let my work speak for itself. And I said, you don't tell an art historian that. <laughs> because we have mastered the art of ventriloquism. <laughs> I'm gonna try this. Okay, it works, okay. <laughs> I wanted to start with this image. I uh, had a wonderful opportunity to write about Carrie James Marshall's work uh, in the late 1990s when I was invited to see this exhibition that he had done at the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago. And as you know, um, Kerry uh, James Marshall was born in Birmingham and uh, grew up in South Central Los Angeles and now lives in Chicago. And um, I don't have to tell you he's become a big art star. One of his uh, pieces just sold a, a day or two ago for 18 million at Sotheby's. So um, it, it's interesting to see how careers evolve over time. But in the late 90s, um, he did this huge installation. And the installation was a, 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 a plaint. It was thinking about uh, loss. Um, the loss of, 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 of lives at the 16th Street Baptist Church in 1963, but also the loss of lives in contemporary Chicago due to gang violence and, and um, this kind of urban uh, tumult. And one of the pieces that I kept on coming back to as I walked through that gallery um, on, on that day in Chicago was, was this work. Um, uh, it, it's actually part of a bigger installation. But what always struck me about it was that it, it, it made an attempt to locate the viewer, the audience, um, at that fateful place and time that several of my co-presenters have already um, alluded to um, over the course of these past few days. But then Kerry James incorporated these, this, this floral um, component, these uh, um, plastic uh, artificial flowers that, that, that crawl uh, along the, the, the edges of this, of this sign. And, uh, and, 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 and it was a simple gesture. It was a kind of perfunctory gesture, but it spoke to moving beyond memoriam to, to, to glimmers of, of, of beauty and color and, and allusions to nature that, uh, that took this into another realm. And I wanted to start with that work by, by Carrie James Marshall because I think that what it does is that it sets us up for thinking about how these gestures, these ordinary quotidian acts that we see within the realm of the self-taught have informed the fine and the contemporary artists. And one of the things that I wanted to also do today is to kind of reveal my, my, my anxieties around this word or this category self-taught. Uh, it's a term that, that we've used quite a bit in art history. It goes back to, to um, the, the early 20th century, the mid 20th century at least. And um, I'm thinking about that famous line by James' uh, son, uh, Thomas, the uh, 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 artist who created these amazing um, um, kind of skulls, um, and he's documented a lot in Bill Ferris's writings. And I think there was a question posed to, to son Thomas about this term self-taught, and he said, well, you know, hey, I mean, everybody has to learn something from somebody. And uh, that stuck with me. And he, I, I think the other comment that he made was, you know, folk artists, well, of course, we're all folks, you know. And these, these sound like kind of simple, trite kind of ideas, but, but I think he was really bringing us to a point 
to, to, to kind of rethink how we um, categorize. And, and, and categorization is very much a part of, of, of kind of part of what I'm doing um, th this morning. Um, I teach a course at, at Duke called Outsiders and Insiders. And uh, I, I purposely call my class Outsiders and Insiders because I want to remind my students that when we think about the art of the everyday folk, when we think about art that, such as Bill Trailer, um, we're talking about artists who, who yes, haven't gone to academies, um, yes, uh, do give the impression through their work that that work is, is untutored. But then I always like to juxtapose an artist like Bill Trailer with an artist like Joseph Cornell, who also did not go to the academy, um, who uh, was an artist who revolutionizes in the, in the early, mid 20th century, the art of assemblage. Um, he was an experimental filmmaker as well. And he often also gets tagged self-taught. But as you might suspect, Joseph Cornell and Bill Trailer are rarely put in the same frame of self-taughtness. And that's where I want us to consider this other concept of outsider versus insider. And also beyond outsider versus insider, what we may also want to think about is, are, are, is that these categories have a way of being quite fluid. That when Bill Trailer starts to do these marvelous, wonderful little drawings um, in downtown Montgomery um, that people thought were weird and curious with the exception of, of Charles Shannon and, and the New South group. Yes, that work was viewed as outsider, but who would have thought by the mid-1970s when I first saw his work in New York City at the Ustrom Gallery, and within five years after that, his work would be seen at the Black Folk Art in America exhibition in Washington, D.C. And subsequent to that, um, Bill Trailer's work garnering all sorts of incredible prices and celebrity in terms of exhibitions and films uh, and the like, that this outsider would all of a sudden become an insider. That this work that was viewed as primitive and basic and ordinary and crude and I, I think some of the terms that were used during that time period evocative of, of cave art would command the prices that they command now that would generate the kinds of interests that, that, that scholars and, and, and thinkers around vi the visual um, keep on coming back to. So, so, so the good news is that these are ideas and these are sensibilities that, that, that one can pigeonhole, but one has to be careful with how that pigeonholing um, uh, evolves or, or, or we need to be attuned to the fact that that pigeonholing um, is, has a way of, of kind of, in its own way, changing our notion and our view of art. I'm thinking about um, the wonderful presentation yesterday by Margaret Lynn about um, the, the Dixie group and, and the New uh, South group. And I was thinking, as I was looking at those works, fantastic, extraordinary artists here in Alabama, but it isn't ironic that sitting um, on the streets of Montgomery was a modernist. Sitting on the corner in that, in that alcove of that, of that store was somebody creating modern art. Art that would stand the test of time and would intrigue uh, and, and sustain um, attention from um, artists and enthusiasts way beyond his lifetime. And 
I was also thinking about this photograph. Arthur Rothstein's Girls at G's Bend, um, 1937. And fortunately, enough scholarship has been done now that has uh, identified her as Artelia Bendall, uh, and that's a name along with the Petaways that um, thanks to um, William Arnett, we now understand and realize are canonical to another extension of this idea of modern art in Alabama. I did a little homework on Artelia Bendolf, and um, I believe this is her obituary from, uh, from a newspaper from July 25th, uh, 2003, Mobile County. Artelia Mildred Bendolf, a homemaker, died Saturday at an area hospital. She was 85. Bendolf was a native of Boykin and a resident of Pritchard. Survivors include one daughter, Daisy Ann Bendolf of Mobile, three sons, Robert Bendolf of Mobile and Willie Bendolf and Israel Bendolf, both of Bridgeport, Connecticut one stepsister, Marie Williams of Selma, and numerous grandchildren. Visitation will be held Saturday from 9 a.m. until 11 a.m. Service at Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church in Pritchard. Burial will be in Whispering Pine Cemetery with Hodges Funeral Chapel on Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue in Mobile directing. And I wanted to, I wanted to, 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 to look at this photograph and I wanted to frame her in a way that, that did justice to her expression. Um, when I see this photograph, and, and you've probably seen it quite a bit in the context of G's Ben um, artistic production, that, that, that Rothstein captures her at this interesting moment, this, this adolescent moment where her body is poised in the window. Um, her head is held up high, her head is slightly tilted, and we sense something beyond the, 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 the Waddle and Daw building, um, the, the, the newspaper that lines the, the interior of the home that we just barely see around the outer edge of uh, the, the, the window space. And I thought, when I saw all of that, and when I thought about her gesture, I thought about love. And uh, since I'm in Alabama, and since I am invoking these, uh, these, these, these outsider, insider spirits of Alabama, I wanted to provide another kind of uh, narrative for this image that comes from who someone who I consider uh, Alabama's premier philosopher, theorist, Lionel Richie. <laughs> On that great album of his, um, his, I don't know if it's called All Night Long, it, we're, we're back to the mid 80s. And I'm thinking about his incredible presentation at the Olympics. But there's another song on that album that I kept on coming back to as I was preparing my, my comments for today. Um, and I'll just read the lyrics. Are you feeling down and lonely? Feeling like you can't go on? Just remember love will find a way. Tell me, are you going through changes? Time seems like it's passing by. Just believe that love will find a way. I see the tears you cry. I see the pain that's in your eyes. So many times you were lonely and no one seemed to care. But if your hopes for tomorrow are drowning in your sorrows, knowing your hurt will show you the way. Outsiders, insiders in Alabama's art world. I visited some years ago uh, Tuskegee, and 
if you've been there, it's almost like a bifurcated experience. You go into the art museum and um, they have a museum and they have a fantastic collection of artwork that they've acquired. But if you don't know, you go into another building and it's a federal building, it's a government building, and it's the Museum for George Washington Carver. In 1896, Booker T. Washington, the first principal and president of Tuskegee Institute, invited George Washington Carver to head its agricultural department. Born in Missouri, Carver taught at Tuskegee for 47 years, developing the department into a strong research center. He taught methods of crop rotation, introduced several alternate cash crops for farmers that would also improve the soil of the areas heavily cultivated in cotton, initiated research into crop production, and taught generations of black students farming techniques for self-sufficiency. Carver fostered agricultural research at Tuskegee, finding new uses for the crops that were familiar to Southern black farmers. And he painted. He learned to paint as a child. And as you can see in this photograph, as a college student um, at um, Simmons College in Indianola, Iowa, he studied art and art classes there. And though he switched to agricultural studies, he continued to paint his entire life. He used Alabama pigments to paint the interior of a local church. He also used them in his own paintings. He developed a rich array of house paint colors to encourage poor farmers to improve the appearance of their homes. He arranged the pigments in pleasing combinations, ceiling colors on top, border and cornice colors in the middle tier, and wall colors on the bottom. The paints were used on the Tuskegee campus and throughout the area. Love will find a way. This is a photograph that uh, we included uh, in an exhibition publication that I did at the end of the 90s to conserve a legacy American art from historically black colleges and universities. And we were very fortunate to partner with Tuskegee and to include um, his work and this photograph uh, in the uh, exhibition. Uh, I look at it and I think that um, this scientist, this, this uh, agriculturalist, this uh, a man who uh, um, does all of this important innovative work related to uh, flora and fauna uh, in Alabama, um, also understands that that work is extended into the realm of painting. Um, painting images of magnolias, uh, painting images of uh, yuccas and, uh, and, and cactus, um, other images such as this, the illustration of, of root um, systems of cow peas and the like. Uh, uh, this, this connection between uh, botany and, and art is something that we've actually talked about a little bit already. Michael Panhorse's wonderful presentation uh, the other day on landscape and, and looking very closely at, um, at Alabama's um, um, uh, flora uh, and um, and, and, and thinking about Booker T. Washington and his, his, his interests uh, in both um, the life and the spiritual um, kind of sustenance of plants you know, and art, um, to me that's not, um, that's not diametrically opposed, that they, they often go hand in hand. Um, when my wife and I um, travel throughout the South and we often go through little towns and we see uh, people's yards that, that have an abundance of, of, of interesting local um, uh, native plants. We, we kind of jokingly look to each other and say, that's George Washington Carver's cousin, you know. <laughs> and, and, and of course what we're zooming in on there is not just this incredible um, um, symphony of, of, of nature, we're looking at the aesthetic uh, display of it. We're looking at how um, these plants and, and this vegetation um, provide this, this really kind of artistic um, 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 message uh, for us. 
And of course, when we think about that, that, that opportunity to move around a community, to, to, to partake of, of, of the exteriors of homes and, uh, and, 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 and the public space uh, writ large, um, we give praise to, to, to William Christian Berry, who, who, uh, who, who opens our eyes to uh, that beauty, uh, to, to the art of these outsiders uh, that, um, that, that can't be confined to a museum. Um, but, well, they can in the sense of, of, of Bill Christianberry using his camera so astutely, uh, so sensitively, and um, showing us um, a side of Palmas building uh, Havana Junction, or um, get back at the shack. <laughs> um, um, the, the power and, and the poetry of signage. Um, I'm thinking, uh, of course, about Walker Evans, um, uh, 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 Bill um, Christian Berry's mentor, who, who, who perhaps opened uh, Christian Berry's eyes to that aesthetic dimension of the South, even in the depths of the Great Depression, uh, when, when so many people are without, um, uh, being able to just turn um, and look down a city street or a country road and see, see, see the beauty that, that, that someone has, 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 has created um, with the most barest of, 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 of elements. As you know, um, Christian Berry was born in Tuscaloosa. Um, he drew his inspiration primarily from Hale County, uh, Alabama, and he focuses on architecture, abandoned structures, nature, and um, extensively studies the, the psychology and effects of, of place and, and, and memory. And these images are haunting. They, they, they come back to us. They, um, they come to us in, in dreams. Uh, they, uh, they, they, uh, they are alive. I, I love this one. Uh, juxtaposed with royal crown, bread of life. And again, we're back to the artificial flowers here incorporated with egg cartons uh, to make a, uh, a, a grave marker. And of course, his very famous um, grave with dead as grave marker um, near Fonsdale, Alabama, and also his two graves, Stewart, Alabama from 1984. I worked with uh, Bill uh, Christian Berry on an exhibit in the late uh, um, 80s called The Blues Aesthetic, Black Culture and Modernism. And um, he brought in um, signs, um, things that he had picked up um, in his travels. And he literally created an installation of all of this signage uh, within um, um, the, the gallery spaces in a stairwell. And it was probably one of the most magnificent and extraordinary um, kind of art pieces that I had um, experienced. And I saw it as part and parcel to um, this idea that I was trying to develop in the context of this exhibition um, entitled The Blues Aesthetic. Bill Trailer, again, is, is, is a touchstone as we think about this idea of plaints and acclamations and love in art. But we also sense in his work not love in the conventional sense or beauty in the uh, conventional sense. What we um, observe or an experience and what we respond to is something um, much more engaging, much more um, interactive, much more passionate than um, than the pretty, than the um, than the um, the, the idle. What we instead uh, experience is something sometimes jarring, as seen in this seated black cat. And I began to think about th that gift of of these outsider artists to opening our eyes to another kind of beauty, a beauty that um, is not conventional, that's not um, uh, Greco-Roman, 
or neoclassical, but sometimes expressive, sometimes rough, uh, sometimes um, um, uh, horrific. Uh, and one of the objects that, that um, I think resonates in some ways with, uh, with, with what um, Trailer was attempting to do in so much of his work, um, one sees um, going back to the 19th century. Um, I was talking earlier with um, um, some of our uh, co-speakers and I was thinking about how it's interesting that here in Alabama, uh, a good number of artists who open our eyes are artists who come from other places and settle here. And one could say that John Frederick Lehman was one of those eye-openers, um, a German immigrant uh, who comes to the United States in 1847, um, naturalized in Kentucky in 1859, and shortly thereafter uh, travels from Kentucky to Randolph County, Alabama. Um, and it's here that he makes his living uh, as a ceramicist, uh, a potter, actually. Let's use that uh, more vernacular term. And we don't have many examples of, of Lehman's work, but, but there is this extraordinary, really quite extraordinary um, jug from uh, 1870, um, ash glaze. And, um, and, and I'm juxtaposing it here with a image of, of men unloading um, uh, pots uh, in Mobile um, in, uh, in 1820, uh, um, rather 1925. And I'm doing this juxtaposition because um, there is um, a, a, a small but significant pottery tradition um, among uh, African Americans uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Alabama. Uh, we don't have a lot of, 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 of kind of concrete material evidence, but we do have references to them. And there's one um, kind of family, the Cribbses, C-R-I-B-B-S, uh, who um, were s enslaved by um, another family called Cribs uh, in, um, in Lamar County. And, and they are documented um, in the literature as being very engaged in this pottery uh, tradition. We don't have evidence of their work, but one wonders when one looks at um, this quite expressive uh, work by Lehman if if there are reverberations of this figurated tradition um, that are yet to be discovered here uh, in, uh, in Alabama. Um, uh, clearly, the other kind of visual referent here are the, um, um, the, 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 the ash glaze and, and um, ceramics of Edgefield County, South Carolina, which also are figurated, which also are expressive um, in this, in this um, kind of in-your-face kind of way. So I think there's a lot more work that, that can be done um, about so much of this. And I, again, I bring this back to, to Trailer as, as, this, uh, as this, uh, uh, this artist who is not afraid to create these images that uh, are, are, are anything but, 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 but pretty, but, 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 but certainly um, bold and, and, and beautiful in, in a kind of a graphic and expressive manner. As you can see, um, looking at Bill Trailer's work from uh, the 1930s and 40s uh, has an eerie resonance with this album cover from the uh, mid-1960s. Um, the album cover is um, um, Angels and Demons at Play. And the artist who created the image uh, and the music uh, is uh, Birmingham's own uh, Herman Blount, also known as Sun Ra. A visionary musician and jazz stylist uh, who um, walked through the world with his own personal mythology and impact on modern music. Um, he, as you can see from this photograph in the lower right-hand corner, um, had his own fashion sense. Um, he experimented with electronic music and free jazz. Uh, I remember going to a Sun Ra concert uh, years ago in Chicago. It was a double bill with him and Alice Coltrane. Uh, Alice Coltrane, the wife of John Coltrane on piano and harp, um, very um, molecular and, and, and beautiful and, and, and incredibly hip. 
and then Sun Ra um, joins the stage and um, starts to play on his electronic music and starts to push those high C notes and everybody's <laughs> doing this <laughs> and, and holding their heads. And, uh, and, and clearly he was trying to take us someplace from where we were. But some of you might know that he was born in Birmingham as Herman Sonny Blount and um, showed musical talent at a very early age, um, graduated from high school in 32, and traveled throughout the Southeast and Midwest as a pianist with a band. And he showed promise. He briefly entered um, the University Alabama A&M in Huntsville, but left the following year. And um, it was around this time that he said that he was abducted by um, a UFO. Um, and in recounting his experiences, he described a beam of light um, that took him to Saturn. Um, he said aliens warned him of impending chaos on Earth and told him he would speak and the world would listen during that time of chaos. So um, is, this, is this just off the top of his head or is he foreshadowing what's gonna happen in this very state in the 1950s and 60s? You figure it out. Blount returned to Birmingham um, after leaving Huntsville and devoted himself to music. He became a talented transposer and arranger and kept abreast of electronic music developments. He was one of the early proponents of electronic music and associated technologies and purchased an electric keyboard when they first became available. And he also used early tape record recorders to record his own band as well as other musical acts that visited Birmingham. And he left Birmingham in uh, 1946 and moved to Chicago, my hometown. And it was in Chicago um, and, um, in 1952 that he officially changes his name from Herman Blount to Sun Ra. And um, the list of achievements and extraordinary contributions goes on after that point. But it's, it's very interesting that as we get to the end of the, 19, of the 20th century, um, Sun Ra has a stroke, um, but he keeps composing, performing, and leading um, his intergalactic orchestra. Um, but in 1992, he returns to Alabama um, to live with his older sister, uh, along with other cousins um, who become his caretaker. Um, and in January, he's admitted to Princeton Baptist Medical Center, suffering from congestive heart failure, respiratory failure, strokes, and circulatory problems. And he dies May 30th, uh, 1993, buried at Elmwood Cemetery, as we were reminded by um, uh, the director of the, um, the museum at the University of Georgia, it's not where you're born, it's, it's where your people are buried. So Sun Ra has this, um, this, this eclectic, expressive side to him that, that is a part of the, the outsider uh, as well as the insider tradition uh, in uh, Alabama as well. Of course, you know most Tolliver. He's one of Montgomery's uh, finest. This is his self-portrait from 1978. Um, it's a piece that's now at the American Folk Art Museum uh, in New York. And you know his story, uh, born um, um, in the Pike Road community uh, near Pintala, Alabama, and moved to Montgomery as, as a teenager and worked for uh, many years as a gardener, a farmer, a house painter, but in the late 60s is forced to retire from his job at a furniture factory here in Montgomery um, after a thousand pound crate of marble fell from a forklift and crushed his legs. His former employer encouraged him to start painting, and Tolliver began to create works such as this self-portrait, um, using house paint on pieces of plywood, masonite, or old furniture. Unable to stand without crutches, he used to sit on his bed to paint, balancing the boards on his knee, and signing his work Moe's T with a backward S and again working with house paints and creating whimsical, sometimes erotic pictures of animals and humans and flora. And, and again, I see him as kind of in concert with Sun Ra, um, in conversation with um, uh, Bill Trailer, and extending this lineage of, 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 of art about love 
but also art of, of a kind of an expressive and colorful and, and vibrant um, love. Um, dying from pneumonia uh, in 2006 here in Montgomery at the uh, age of 82. And of course what I've been describing gets culminated in this work that we see uh, in uh, the work of Lonnie Holly. Um, here, his memorial at Friendship Church from 2006. Um, Lonnie Holly is really a, a quite an important and, and pivotal figure in um, modern Alabama art. Born in 1950 uh, in Birmingham, um, as uh, Langston Hughes says in his poet, life for him wasn't no crystal stair. Um, from the age of five, he worked at various jobs, picking up trash at the drive-in movie theater, washing dishes and cooking. He lived in a whiskey house on um, state fairgrounds and in several foster homes. His early life was peripatetic, chaotic, and he was never afforded the pleasure of a real childhood. But circa 1979, he is um, um, inspired to create um, a tombstone for his sister's two siblings, his sister's two children who die in a house fire. And using the soft sandstone um, like byproducts of the metal castings, which were discarded all throughout um, um, the, the, the poor communities of, of, of Birmingham, um, led him to um, find materials and become inspired as an artist. He makes other carvings and assembles them in his yard alongside other found objects. In 1981, he brought a few examples to the Birmingham Museum, and thanks to their vision and foresight, um, they display these works, and they pass on the word about this extraordinary artist uh, to uh, the Smithsonian, and he's featured in a major exhibit that same year, More Than Land and Sky, Art from Appalachia. And he continues to be an extraordinary and pivotal figure, not just in the visual arts, but interestingly like Sun Ra in music as well. And like the G's Ben women, not just making quilts, but singing as well. Like um, George Washington Carver, not just a visual artist, but working in these other forms and fashions. So we often talk about multi-talented um, 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 artists um, from um, this place. And as I mentioned yesterday in my presentation uh, in, the, in, in the art gallery, we have Lonnie Holly to thank, to thank for introducing Bill Arnett to, uh, to, to, to Thornton Dial. Uh, Thornton Dial, um, a pioneering uh, artist known for large scale um, assemblages but, but in this case, I decided to show you um, a work called Life Go On from 1990. A very, very interesting and, 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 and expressive work, again, in this, in this more expressive genre that, that I've shown you so far. Dial is also working between uh, Birmingham and Bessemer. Um, he is a... a, um, a, a a retired from that, 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 that foundry work that we, that we heard about yesterday, um, the, the work, the heavy duty work that has to deal with metal and, and, and castings and, and, and hard, rough physical labor. And, 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 and like many um, artists, um, uh, he, he doesn't really discover his talents as an artist until after um, that, 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 that long life uh, making a living uh, in, uh, um, in the factories and the like. And when that plant closes in 1981, he retires from welding and construction and devotes himself to this, 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 um, this public art that we just talked about, as well as um, artwork for, for the home. And it's in 1987 that he meets, um, that Lonnie Holly rather introduces him to William Arnett and um, the rest uh, is, is, is history. Um, I met Bill Arnett and Lonnie Holly more or less at the same time. Um, and and, and as, as I was telling someone yesterday, I'll, I'll never forget going into this palatial uh, mansion in, in Buck, 
Buckhead, Atlanta, and um, being surprised that, that despite the exterior of this home, when one, when one entered Bill Arnett's house, um, it was art just stacked up on, on the wall. And, and most of the work was um, at this time by Thornton Dial, who he was really kind of championing and saying, you know, this is, this is someone that, 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 Rick, I want you to write about and that I want others to write about. And, um, and I know that, that, that Bill Arnett is a kind of a controversial figure, but, but I see him in some ways as, as our um, Medici, um, our um, visionary who sees people and artists and talents that nobody else sees as having value and importance and, 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 and forces us to really engage with this new work, this work that maybe we don't quite understand yet, but, but we will by and by. You know Bill Arnett's story as related to, to um, the G's Ben story. And I wanted to, to park um, more on one of the quilters, um, someone whose work I find particularly extraordinary, and that's Annie Mae Young. Here's a photograph that um, Ro Roland Freeman, the very, very important um, uh, photographer and, and chronicler of, of, of outsider art, uh, and, and communities between Washington D and D.C. and the South. Um, um, Annie Mae is a Petaway. She's Annie Mae, or rather, P Annie Mae Petaway Young, was born in 1928 in G's Bend slash Boykin, and died in 2013 in Alberta, Alabama. And she made her first quilts while still a child, following that handed down tradition uh, I love uh, Essie's comment yesterday that um, somebody, um, that she saw a quilt or somebody saw a quilt and they said, you know, that was your quilt. And she said, no, my quilt is at home. That's my mother's quilt. And that there was this kind of unreal realization on her part that, that, that these, these traditions and that these, these aesthetics had been passed down and into her and that when she created what she created, she was really a part of this lineage, this community of, 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 of quilters and image makers. What I like about Annie Mae Young's work, however, is that there's this incredible, um, what I call, economy. There's this use of, of, of again, found um, textiles, mostly overalls and, 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 and um, old clothes, um, but I think there's a line that she says, I, I wasn't into cutting those tiny little pieces. <laughs> I wanted to do something that, that I could do with relative you know, um, ease. Um, and, and where she pulls back on, on the, the minutia of, 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 of kind of quilting, she, she makes up for in terms of these extraordinary um, re repetitions and improvisational kind of patterns and, and shapes. She tells us when I was growing up, I went to school but didn't get to but seventh grade. I had to walk about eight miles to school. We used to go there and go around picking up trash and put it in old heaters to keep ourselves warm. And, um, and, and, and I could read more and more about her work f f for you, but I won't. I'll just show you some of this extraordinary work. And I wanted to end today on Kajo Lewis who was one of those people who was brought from West Africa to the United States uh, in, uh, in the uh, kind of waning days of slavery and sets up a community in, outside of Mobile called Africa Town. And when I looked at this photograph, I immediately thought of the woman who brought his story to people's attention. And um, her name is Zora Neale Hurston. And Zora Neale Hurston writes uh, in an essay in 1930 about her engagements with the community of Mobile, Alabama, of Africatown. And she says, on the walls of the homes of the average Negro, one always finds a glut of gaudy calendars, wall pockets, advertising lithography, I saw in Mobile, Alabama, a room in which the walls were gaily papered with Sunday supplements of the Mobile Register. There were seven calendars and three wall pockets. 
One of them was decorated with a lace doily. The mantel shelf was covered with a scarf of deep homemade lace looped up with a huge bow of pink crepe paper. Over the door was a huge lithograph showing the Treaty of Versailles being signed by a Waterman fountain pen. It was grotesque, yes, but it indicated the desire for beauty. And decorating a decoration, as in the case of the doily on the gaudy wall pocket, did not seem out of place to the hostess. The feeling in back of such an act is that there can never be enough beauty, let alone too much. I'll repeat that. <laughs> there was in the back of such an act that there can never be enough beauty, let alone too much. And that's what I want to leave you with today, this idea of the outsider artist providing us what seems like a surfeit, but re in reality is something that offers yet more to come. <laughs>